Pastel matte is an amazing surface that plays well with a variety of different art media, including pan pastel, pastel pencils, and colored pencils. This is an exceptional surface for drawing detailed animal fur, but in order to create beautiful animal drawings, it's important that you understand the characteristics of this paper, the limitations of this surface, and that you also avoid several common mistakes. Hey, I'm Lana Gloshaw, and in this video, I will be discussing the top 10 tips that artists make when they use pastel mat, particularly when they're drawing animals on this surface. As I discuss mistakes one through nine, I'll be sharing real examples, and I'll be showing you exactly how to fix these mistakes and how to avoid them in the future. This video is a little bit longer than normal, so grab your favorite beverage and a notebook and get ready to learn. And if you make it all the way to the end, I have some really special tips tips and demos for you when we discuss mistake number 10. I don't want to give it all away, but these tips are going to be focusing on how to create more creative, more compelling, and more meaningful artwork, and you won't want to miss it. Let's get started with a brief discussion on pastel map. If you don't already know, pastel mat is a toned velvety surface on top of a really stiff, rigid card. This velvety surface is great for laying almost an infinite number of layers on top of each other, including light value colored pencils over darker media. This is a really great asset when you are drawing animal fur because you can lay those really light hairs over the top of darker values. I also love this paper when I'm using pastels because this velvety surface holds the pastel onto the paper and you have much less mess than you would working on a sanded surface or working on a traditional cotton paper. Mistake number one is a little bit cheeky, but honestly, one of the biggest mistakes I see when artists are drawing animals is them not using pastel mat or another textured surface that allows them to layer light hairs over dark hairs. This particular photo was submitted by Mark in my Facebook group, Lana Glowshot's Critique Corner, and it consists of pan pastel, pastel pencils, alcohol markers, and colored pencils on a white vellum surface. And in his comment, Mark talks about not being able to create enough variety in value and enough depth in the fur. And honestly, probably the reason for this is not using a textured surface. When you're on a white vellum paper like this, you're gonna be very limited with how many layers you can apply. And you'll also not be able to lay those light hairs over the top of dark hairs. But let's pretend that Mark was using pastel mat, and I'm gonna show you how he can add more depth to the fur. So one of the things that I wanna do first with this dog is just to expand the values. And I wanna show you why that would be important. So here I'm just laying down a backdrop so that you can see the colors that I'm swatching. And I'm going to start with the colors in Mark's drawing. I've got this as my darkest color right here. Then I've got this as my mid color. And then as my lightest color, I have something kind of like this. This value range is pretty close together. I'm gonna to take a look at the photo reference and see how far apart my values are there. So my darkest value is a little bit darker than what Mark's got. My mid value is about here, kind of where his darkest value is. And then my lightest values range from I've got some of this, which is a little bit lighter, but then the very lightest in the fur is gonna be quite a bit lighter than what he's got. I've got a much fuller value range in the photograph, and so adding more value contrast is gonna create more depth in the fur. I'm gonna start by building up depth in the shadows, and I'm gonna do that with this darker color right here along the neck. Now, of course, you would do this with a very sharp colored pencil, and you'd pay very close attention to the direction of the hairs and lay in individual hairs. I'm using a, a blunter instrument so that you can see what I'm doing relatively quickly. So here's the dark and maybe I've got a couple other little darks peeking through here in the fur. Now I'm going to pick up some of that mid value color and I'm going to start transitioning some of those hairs out away from the neck. Then with my lightest color, I'm going to use the direction of my mark to enhance the volume, and I'm going to transition those hairs around. And this should be happening throughout the entire neck. Push the darks and the lights quite a bit more. 
If you find yourself in a situation where you do need to layer light hairs over the top of dark hairs and your paper and your materials aren't allowing you to do that with just your colored pencils on their own, you do have a couple of options. One of my favorite product combos are two products from Brush and Pencil, the Touch Up Texture and the Titanium White. You can mix these two products together to create kind of this white liquid color pencil paint and you can paint them directly onto your surface. If you want to learn more about that process, I'm going to link a video all about how I use these products in the notes below. Mistake number two is not using a high quality photo reference. Now, if you've watched any of my critique videos before, this is not going to be new information, but I can't stress enough how important it is to use high quality photo references when you're creating any kind of drawing. When you're working on a pet portrait, having a high quality photo reference is going to give you more to work with and it's going to require you making up less out of your head. Let's take a look at this photo and discuss why it isn't an ideal photo to work with. So one of the reasons this particular photo isn't working out so well is because the whites in the face are so blown out. When I look at this particular area that's much lighter in value, I am not seeing individual hairs very much. Even if I zoom in, there are really just these big chunks of white and I can't see what's going on there. So I don't have a lot of information on adding more color and more depth to the fur. This is an example where you can see a lot more going on in the fur. If I come into this particular area, I can see some light areas, I can see some darker areas. And so I have some information now on different colors that I can play around with to add more depth to this particular photo reference. Now let's take a look at what a good photo reference looks like. This is an example of a photo with good light. Coming in through the window, I've got nice warm light that's creating a really interesting shadow shape on the dog's face. And you wanna to strive to find photos that have a really clear shadow shape and light shape. However, when I zoom into this photo, it doesn't necessarily have the best clarity, which is why I didn't select this particular photo for my drawing. This photo has great lighting again. We've got a natural light source coming in through a window on the right that's out of the frame. But we also have exceptional clarity. If you zoom into this photo, you can see the individual hairs on the dog, which makes it an excellent candidate for a photo reference for a dog portrait. Whenever possible, use the highest quality photo reference that you can. But I totally understand that this isn't always an option, especially if you're working on a pet portrait for a pet that is deceased or for a client that doesn't really know how to take quality photo references of their pet. If you're in a situation like this, do a deep dive on the internet and find some photos of animals that resemble the animal that you're drawing. For this particular golden retriever, I just Googled old golden retrievers and found a bunch of pictures where the whites aren't completely blown out and where there is more detail and more depth in the fur. And I can use these to enhance the information that I have in my original photo reference. If you remember from earlier videos, I judge a quality photo reference on its clarity, how clear it is when I zoom in, its composition, is it a pleasing, interesting, and compelling image to look at, and its light source. Is there a clear light source that is creating light shapes and shadow shapes on the form? I'm gonna give you a little quiz and I'm gonna pop up a new photo on the screen. I want you to pause this video for a second and I want you to rate this particular photo from one to 10 in each of these three categories. Now I'm gonna share with you my ratings. When it comes to clarity, I'm gonna give this piece a five out of 10. Now that score comes from zooming in, taking a look at individual hairs and realizing that I'm not able to get a lot of information from this photo. Sure, it could be fuzzier, that's why it got a five, but I'm shooting for as clear as possible. Composition refers to the arrangement of objects on the page and how compelling they are. When I look at this piece, I love that the portrait is in the center and that I'm able to see all parts of the dog's face. But the thing that is bothering me the most is that the dog is not making eye contact with me. I keep looking over my right shoulder. What is that dog looking at? 
this would have been a much stronger composition if the dog was looking at me. So for composition, I'm going to give it a six out of 10. Now we're getting into light source. When it comes to light source, there is probably light coming in from the left, but it's not a very clear light source. I'm not able to identify any specific light shapes or shadow shapes in this piece, other than the small cast shadows that are happening underneath the ear. So for lighting, I'm going to give this a five out of 10. This is the drawing that was created from this photo reference, and it was submitted by an artist in my Facebook group, Lana Glowshot's Critique Corner. There are so many great things going on in this pet portrait already, but we are going to take a really close look at your proportions. And that is going to be the topic of mistake number three, inaccurate proportions or a lack of structure. Although this drawing is relatively close, there are a couple of structural or proportional issues that detract from the realism. The first one that I notice is the size of the eyes. The eyes in this drawing are too big. They should be a little bit smaller. If I came in and cropped them just a tiny bit, I would already get a much more realistic look. We tend to see bigger eyes in illustrations and cartoons, so that's taking it out of that realistic space. Additionally, when you're looking at structure, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth are always on a parallel. So here I've got a parallel on the eyes, and I want that same parallel to transfer over to my drawing. When I come over here, I'm going to make this eye smaller, and I'm going to keep it on the same parallel. I also want the nose on that same parallel. So when I come over here to check, I'm noticing the nose is actually off quite a bit. If I erase this line, and I'm gonna actually need to shift the nose up like this and drop it down a little bit so that it's on the same parallel as the eyes. It's a minor tweak, but it's gonna make a huge difference. You'll see the same parallel happening in the ears and on the bottom of the face as well. So those are great things to check to make sure that your structure is on. The other structural issue that I'm noticing is the nose. I want to see a side of the nose, a top of the nose, and potentially a little bit of the other side of the nose. And right now I'm not really clear on where that is, particularly because the lines are going in this direction. It kind of feels like my nose is sort of at a point or something something on the top. So creating a more structured line drawing that really focuses on the structure of that muzzle is going to allow you to come in and create a more accurate drawing. Instead of hairs going this direction, what I would like to have seen is hairs that are moving up and out towards the outer side. That's going to create the volume that you need in the muzzle in an accurate way. I strongly suggest that for any animal artwork, you begin with a really structured line drawing. This can be on a separate sheet of paper, or it can be right on your drawing surface, depending on what you are most comfortable with. Of course, you can always trace, but building the skill of being able to draw accurately from a photo reference and eventually from life is a crucial skill as an artist. If you would like a little bit more support with your drawing skills, the first module in my online course, Introduction to Classical Colored Pencil Painting, focuses on teaching you how to accurately draw from a photo reference. And there is a free trial of that course down in the notes below. If you find yourself in the unfortunate position of realizing that your proportions are off on your final drawing, know that you are not alone. We've all done this at some point. And one of the things that I love about pastel matte is that it's a much more forgiving surface and you're going to be able to repair a lot of these proportional issues. This drawing was submitted to me by one of the artists I work with one-on-one -on -one over Zoom. During our one-on-one -on -one critique, we discussed how the proportions were off and that the eye needed to be shifted up and over a bit. Because she was working on a textured surface, she was able to repair these proportions and ended up with this awesome drawing of the dog. If you would like to learn exactly how to fix your proportions, be sure to tune in next week because I am going to be taking one of my drawings that had some proportional issues and I am going to be fixing it for you. I'm gonna show you every step of the way, how I noticed these mistakes and how I fixed them. So if you don't wanna miss that video, be sure to turn on your notifications. Mistake number four is not building up depth in the fur. When we talk about depth in art, we're referring to the space either between the foreground and the background or the space between different objects in a composition.
Now, when we're looking at depth in the fur, we're actually talking about the space between individual hairs on the animal. If you have great depth in your fur, then there is the illusion that light and space can pass between these hairs and that it's not just one solid mass. The fur on this dog feels stiff and solid. If the artist had begun with darker darks in the shadows, or if that artist chooses to do so now, we'll probably be able to create more depth. I would like to start with a color like this, and I'd like to build that up right here with individual hairs. Again, I'm using a pretty bold mark so that you can see what I'm doing, but you should use a really sharp pencil and layer this slowly and steadily with really crisp marks. There's also a little bit of a shadow coming in over here. Then I can grab a mid-value color. I can start transitioning that out of the darkest color of the ear, individual strokes to create that really nice sense of depth. I'm gonna come over and grab a lighter color, but I'm actually gonna make that color even lighter than I see in the photograph so that I'm able to create a little bit more volume as I come around the ear. And then with these furs in the foreground, I'm going to come in again with a slightly lighter color and I'm going to layer those hairs right over the top. Creating those individual hairs with space in between them is going to create more depth in the fur, help that light and air to move around in it so that it doesn't feel like a big solid mass. Here's another set of drawings where the fur is starting to feel a little bit massy. I'm gonna come in, push the value a little bit and create space in between the individual hairs. I'm gonna start in this area of the ear with those darkest darks and I'm going to apply the dark hairs first. Starting with the darkest hairs is going to help you create a nice sense of depth as you build up from dark to light. Now I'm going to start with those hairs that are just a little bit lighter than the darkest darks. I'm layering hair by hair and I'm paying really close attention to how long the hairs are so that I can create that really nice variety. Now I'm gonna come in with the lighter hairs. I'm gonna go a little lighter than it shows in this particular photo so that I get that contrast. I'm gonna go over the top with little light hairs and I'm gonna bring some of those all the way out to the edge. Finally, I'm going to come in with those lighter, lighter hairs towards the outside of the ear. I'm not going to have them all the same. I'm going to intentionally create some variety in those light hairs so that, again, it feels like there is space and air moving through them and they're not acting like one solid mass. And here, we're starting to see the space between those hairs a little bit more. We're breaking up the mass of that brown fur. If you would like to see an in-depth video on how to build up depth in the fur, make sure that you check out this video where I show you the entire process on how I layer fur to create really incredible depth. Mistake number five is that the values in your drawing are off. Value in art refers to the lightness or the darkness of a given color. And if your values are off, it can completely throw off your illusion of depth and your illusion of volume and form. One thing that I absolutely love about pastel matte is that it comes in a variety of colors that are not just white. And this allows you to work on a mid-value surface. When you work on a mid-value surface, you are both adding value as you make your colors darker than the paper, and you are subtracting value as you add colors that are lighter than the paper. Being able to work in both directions can help you increase your accuracy when it comes to matching values. When you're working on a piece of white paper, you have to add every single bit of value to that kind of zero level white, and that can be a lot harder to create accurate values. But if you're not used to working on a tone surface, it can take a little bit of time to get used to. When you're working on animals that are multicolored, meaning that they have fur that is growing in different colors, it's incredibly important to pay attention to the values. Because in this particular drawing, we have white hair on the ears, but this white hair is changing in value depending on where it is on the ear and how it's being hit by the light source. 
We also have the same thing happening in the brown fur. Here we have a section that is lighter than this section, which is darker than this section, which is the darkest. So I'm going to show you how I would adjust the values a little bit in this drawing. I'm going to start by looking at the white around the eyes. Now in this particular eye, it's much darker and I'm going to do a color swatch to show you exactly how dark that is compared to what this artist has drawn. So here I've got the white, which is actually reading much more like a gray, but this particular artist drew it almost a white. It's almost the same as that white that I put down first. So I definitely need to make those values darker. I'm going to steal this gray right here and I'm going to start applying it into the area around the eye of this little animal. Now it's even a little bit darker still up above the eye, a little bit warmer. I'm going to grab some of this purple and I'm going to sketch it in. Now this is going to sink this eye back a little bit further in the shadows and I'm scrubbing it in really quickly. So I'm not paying attention to all the little details. Please take your time on this. I just want to give you a quick effect as to how this is going to change the drawing. Now I'm going to look at the area around the eye. This is going to be much darker fur and these particular, I'm going to show you in red here, these particular little hairs that are sticking out, those are also going to be in shadow. So we want to make sure that those hairs are darker as well. I'm going to continue to come in with the darkest color in the fur. I'm going to push the darks a little bit more in these areas, kind of clean up some of that um, outlining around the eye. And then I'm going to come in with a color that is darker for these these eyelashes or this hair right above the eye. So it's reading in this particular photo like kind of a gray and I'm going to go over the top of those with this muted gray color. It's going to tone it down a little bit. I still think that I want to come in and make some of those darks around it a little bit darker. So I'm going to carve out that shape a little bit more. And this can come all the way over to the second animal's face. And I can, of course, mix in some other colors that are going to add some more depth and variety, but I want to make sure that all of these colors are quite dark compared to the other areas that are being hit more by the light source. There is still a lot more that could be done on this drawing in terms of developing and pushing the values a little bit more, but hopefully at this point you can see patterns starting to emerge and you can see how making the light move across the form by varying the values is going to add a much more realistic quality to your animals. Without the adjustments, this drawing is reading more like an illustration because the value and the shapes are simplified a little bit more than they need to be for a realistic drawing. And if illustration is your goal, you definitely want to be simplifying and generalizing information. But if you're going for realism, then you do need to pay a little bit more attention to your values. If you've gotten something of value out of this video so far, I would love it if you nudge that like button. That helps support the channel and spread this video to more audiences. I would also love to hear what your thoughts are on the mistakes. Be sure to let me know which mistakes you've been making or if there are some mistakes about working with pastel mat that I've missed. Mistake number six is having stiff edges and contours. One of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to animal art is looking at the edge of a drawing and realizing that all of the lines are created in the exact same way. They're all the exact same length and they're all the exact same width and they all come to exactly the same depth. Now, that is not the way that fur forms. Hairs are different lengths. They're going in slightly different directions and your animal is going to feel a lot more lifelike if there is some natural irregularity occurring in those contours of your animal drawing. When I zoom in to look closely at the contours around the ear, I'm noticing that all of my hairs are ending at about the same spot and I'm getting a pretty stiff edge all the way around. And I wanna break this up by adding individual hairs with individual strokes with my pencil. I'm going to let some of them come off the edge a little bit here 
And if it's hard to see because I haven't finished the background first or the background is not contrasting quite enough, what I can do is I can draw back in and carve out some of those hairs a little bit more. It's easier to be able to draw right on top with the dark, but you can, you can do this both ways. So I'm gonna kind of edge in with the dark and then I'll come back in with the light. Now, if you're doing this on pastel mat, you will be able to push and pull in both directions. But if you are working on a traditional white cotton paper, then you're going to need to be a lot more strategic with the order in which you layer your pencils. As I come around the edge, I'm selecting different colors for my pencil so that I can have a lot of variety in that value around the ear. And then I can also pick some of these colors that the artist has in the background. And I actually might even make these just a tiny bit darker so I can create that really realistic edge around the, the animal's ear. Now that I'm done with that, I'm gonna zoom in and show you the edge. And although it's a bit pixelated, you can see how this compared to what was before, it's just a lot more natural with those random, loose, uneven hairs going around the contour. The hair around the eyes and the nose is done in a really great way. There are some little hairs that are coming off of these big chunks and it feels really natural. But as I move towards the edge of this dog, I see some more issues with the contours, particularly this area and this area. And we're going to be talking about the top of the head as well. We really want the dog to stand out from the background in a really natural way. And I'm gonna show you how you can create a little bit more of that by working both into the background and into the terrier. So I'm gonna come over and steal some of these dark colors from the photo reference, and I'm going to emphasize my darks a little bit more. I'm gonna do that really specifically, and it might be hard to see exactly what I'm doing because I am using a sharper um, instrument for this draw over so that I can really get those fine hairs. When you do this, make sure that you're using a really sharp pencil so that you can get those individual hairs as well. So I'm letting some of these darker hairs kind of float in the background. I actually want to cool that down a little bit and grab a darker, cooler brown as well. And I'm going to pull some of those in. I'm anchoring those darker hairs in first. And they, the ones that I am putting in are much thinner than the lines that the artist has. And I think that that's definitely going to help create a nice sense of, of air and light moving through these hairs. I'm gonna grab this background color and I'm going to edge the background back into the fur. So I'm basically like slicing back in to create a little bit more variety in the edge of the dog's face here. So I'm gonna come back over the top again with some lighter colors. I'm actually going to darken up this a little bit so that those lighter colors are gonna read a little bit better. Now, when you pick these colors, you might actually pick a white or you could pick a color that's just slightly off white and save those whites for the, uh, just a very few special places in the drawing. Now let's zoom out and take a look. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add one more little hair here. Okay, I'm gonna kinda come through here. I'm gonna add a couple thin ones that are just flying away a bit. And then I'm gonna zoom out and we'll take a look at that edge. And if I were to take that edge and kind of repeat it all the way around, have a couple looser edges, a couple looser hairs, I think that it's gonna feel a lot more realistic. We want this dog to feel really scruffy. And to do that, we need a lot of irregular random hairs kind of floating around. Mistake number seven is having no plan for the background or the color composition. This drawing by Maggie was done on a piece of Sienna pastel mat, and she hasn't applied anything to the background yet, so the color of the background is the exact color of the paper. When I look at her photo reference, it totally makes sense why she chose this color of pastel mat. There are a lot of dark, rich, warm browns in the dog's fur, and having that as a base color to work from is going to help her judge her colors and her values really accurately. But when I look around the contours of this dog, I'm losing some of those individual hairs, particularly at the top of the head. There isn't quite enough contrast there. And when I look at this piece as a whole, 
whole, it's kind of giving me this dated 70s vibe between the orange of the harness, the brown in the background, and the yellow in the dog's fur. So if she applies a different color to the background over the top of the Sienna pastel mat, she's going to be able to create a more modern color composition and also be able to create more contrast between the background and the fur. But which color should she pick? I'm gonna take Maggie's photo reference, I'm gonna drop it into Photoshop, and I'm gonna show you exactly how I pick out my background colors. In Photoshop and most other editing softwares, you can use tools to quickly select the background, cut it out, and dump new colors in. This brown color is most similar to that color that we started with, but I wanted to try something that contrasted with that orange. So I tried a darker blue and then a lighter blue, and I liked both of these options. Just for contrast, I'm gonna throw in an orange, just like the harness, and I really don't like that combination. But I wanted to play around with maybe a gradient, so I programmed that in, and I tried a gradient from green to blue. I decided that this was a really great opportunity for a triadic color scheme of orange, green, and violet. So I adapted that a little bit and was able to come up with a composition that I really liked. Mistake number eight is not working from background to foreground. Now, when it comes to creating any drawing, I'm really trying to establish and finish the background and those pieces that are further away before I move to the foreground. That helps me establish a really nice sense of depth. But this is incredibly important when it comes to animal artwork because in those final layers of the fur, I'm drawing individual hairs that overlap the background. And if that background isn't completed, then I am forced to draw the background around each and every hair, and that is gonna make it look super sloppy, super messy, and it's a pain in the neck. Most of the animal drawings submitted over in Lana Glowshot's Critique Corner didn't have a background, so this didn't come up as an issue. But in most cases, I feel that a background would have made the pieces much stronger, even if it was just a carefully selected color gradient. Backgrounds help develop depth in your piece, they can create a mood and a context, and occasionally they can create a story. Using that Photoshop program that I showed you earlier, I've selected the background from several of my animal portraits and I have deleted it. And then I'm showing it to you next to the original portrait. And I'd like you to take a moment to just analyze how the background adds context, interest, and a story to each of these portraits. Mistake number nine is selecting the wrong color of pastel mat. With so many colors available, it can be incredibly overwhelming to try to select just the right color for your project. Or you might not even realize why it matters if you're going to cover the entire thing up with your art materials anyway. But I promise that taking the time to carefully and intentionally select a color of pastel mat can enhance your piece and elevate your experience. This piece was submitted by Lorenza in Lana Glowshot's Critique Corner, and it's done on a piece of anthracite pastel mat, which is basically just black. When you look at her photo reference, that makes a ton of sense. If she uses black paper, she's not going to need to apply a black background, right? Well, the other thing you need to keep in mind is that each and every one of these individual hairs was applied over the top of black paper, and that black cool color is soaking the color and the intensity out of the color she's applying over the top. And she ended up with a piece that looks pretty good, but there isn't a lot of richness and vibrancy in the fur. I would have used a wine color piece of pastel mat. This dark, rich red color is going to add color and intensity to all of the color she lays on top. She's going to have warmth coming through all of those layers because she's starting on a warmer colored surface. And if she really wants that black background in the end, she can always grab some black pan pastel or a black pastel stick and apply it over the background. This might actually look better because there's going to be some red peeking through, which is going to add depth in the background as well. Unfortunately, there isn't an easy recipe for selecting just the right color of pastel mat, but there's definitely some color theory and some experience that I have that I would love to share with you if you're interested. So if you'd like a video focusing on how to select the right color of pastel mat for your project, let me know in the comments below. 
you've made it all the way to mistake number 10. And mistake number 10 is that your artwork doesn't transcend the photo. By this I mean that your artwork is basically an exact copy of the photo that you started with, and if you started with a pretty boring photo, you probably ended up with a pretty boring drawing. So how do you make interesting artwork? Artwork that matters and that speaks to people. Like so many other aspects of art, there isn't an exact formula to creating artwork that transcends the photo. Some artists do this by developing a really unique personal style, and other artists do this with really interesting cropping, spacing, or compositional choices. I personally love to play around with color and storytelling to create artwork that transcends the photo, and I'm going to show you how I would do that using Lorenza's photo reference that she used for this cat. Sometimes I will have a story or an idea already in mind when I get a photograph, but other times I have a photograph that I like and I start playing around with it. For this particular photograph, I started moving the composition around and I decided that I wanted some space around the cat's head. It's looking up and I thought it would be really fun if it was looking at something. I found these butterflies and I really liked the circular effect that they created, almost like a halo around the cat's head. So I started playing around with how that fit within the composition and then I started working with background colors. I mostly played around with blues and violets and I changed the value and intensity to kind of create a different day or night effect. I ended up liking the day colors a little bit more and settled on these light blues with the gradation in the back. I then finalized my composition with cropping and here it is compared to the original. There is a context and a story now that is going to add more interest for the viewer. 